The letter is presented by Hunt a Killer. If you love intricate puzzles and unpredictable mysteries, Hunt a Killer could be exactly what you've been waiting for. They make immersive murder mystery games where you get to be the detective. You can pick from standalone one-shot criminal cases, longer multi-chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. They also make great gifts for the game, mystery, or true crime lover in your life. Solve a mystery, hunt a killer. Go to huntakiller.com slash the letter and use the code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. If you need the news, but also need to feel smarter and calmer, then you need to get in Andy Slavitt's bubble. Andy is a former White House advisor and the ultimate outsider's insider. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Andy offers his access to leading experts. Join Andy for discussions on COVID, gun violence, climate change, and more. In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt is available wherever you get your podcasts. Lemonada. Before we get started, a warning to listeners. This podcast includes descriptions of gun violence and associated trauma. And a heads up, this episode includes the sounds of gunfire and cannons. Yvette Rodier Evans has waited nearly 18 months for this day, the day a judge would sentence the man who shot and left her for dead. Evans said she can still smell the smoke from the gun and hear the shots ringing in her ears. It's a, a scary thing to remember, and that I remember it so clearly is what's very painful. Will this help ease some of those fears you talked about? No. I'll always be afraid of the night. I'll always be afraid to be alone. That fear, Yvette told reporters, would stay with her even after her attacker was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She didn't know it then, but one of her most significant challenges would be finding a way to reclaim her life in the shadow of that fear. The journey would turn out to be less of a straight and clear path and more of a roller coaster. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Amy Donaldson, and this is The Letter. Episode 6, Making Peace with the Shadows. It's the summer of 2021, and because of COVID, like many people, Yvette Rodier is working from home. Producer Andrea Smartin and I are visiting her there. We punch in a code that will open the security gate accessing the community where she now lives with her husband and daughter. Their home sits in the shadow of the same mountain range where her good friend Zachary Snar was murdered and where she was gravely wounded. The gate faces a noisy, busy Salt Lake County road. But once we're inside the community of neatly arranged, well-kept homes, the noise seems to disappear. We ring the bell, and Yvette's husband, Dave Whitby, ushers us inside. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Come on in. Thank you. Yvette is seated at the family's dining room table in front of a laptop, finishing up a video conference. She and Dave are just back from a vacation in Mexico, and she's wearing a neatly pressed white button-up shirt with her thick, dark hair pulled away from her face by a pearl headband. Her smile is warm, and she exudes a calm, almost unflappable quality. As we settle into a quiet room down the hall from where she works, Andrea asks if her past has anything to do with living in a gated neighborhood. It wasn't something we chose, um, but moving into this community has been outstanding for me, and it definitely has brought this safe feeling to me that I didn't know I was missing. It probably was within the first few months of living here and pushing the button for the gate and knowing that there's no cars around me and that I go into the gate, I am now in a safe place. It just feels so good. And I know it's just a metal gate, but 
for some reason to have my car be protected and not be out in a parking lot where people can just be there. This is just an extra piece that is really lovely to have. The gate helps Yvette feel more secure, but it can't keep out the nightmares that she's had since the shooting more than 25 years ago. The nightmares have been me with someone that I care about, another male, often Zach, and we're in random places. They, I, we can be at a restaurant, we could be at a park, we could be at somebody's house, and then someone comes in and just open fires and kills them. And sometimes I die or think I'm dead in the nightmare, but it's always for sure the other person. Those are really hard to wake up from. And that's been the struggle of Yvette's entire adult life. Since she first woke up in that hospital room, how does she escape the terror of this trauma? Among her first questions, why did she survive? Why was Zachary the one killed? And what would he do if he'd lived? She left the hospital with holes in her head and her side and a leg that dragged when she walked. She had no idea how those physical wounds would heal. But she was determined about one thing. The shooting wasn't going to stop her from living the life she'd planned. Just a couple of weeks after leaving the hospital, she went out on a date with Dave, the man she'd eventually marry. But their path to a life together was what one might call a long and winding road. So... The funniest part about this, my current husband, I went on a date with him the night before the shooting. I've had a crush on him since high school. In fact, he asked me out on a date the next night, and I said no because I had a date with Zach. So he was my, my current husband was my very first date after the shooting. The date was far from normal. I don't think I've ever seen a more afraid mother letting her daughter go out for the first night out again after something like that. And, you know, she knew me, we had dated before, and I just said, I'll have, you know, I'm picking her up here, here's where we're going, here's the time we're going to be back. And you would have just thought I was taking a newborn baby from, you know, a mother born that day. I mean, she did not want you to leave her sight. We went to a Ute football game. Worst mistake of my life. The Utes have the cannon, and none of us knew how I would respond, but I did not respond well. They fire the cannon after every touchdown, so we had to go after maybe a second score. That was one of the first signs that reclaiming her life would involve more than healed holes and fading scars. Anyone close to her was going to have to realize the complexity of daily life. He took me home and he was in college and having a lot of fun and, and I was a bit of extra work, if you will. So we kind of just lost, lost touch for a little bit. Just a few months later, Dave was surprised to receive an invitation to a vet's wedding. She was going to marry Jeremy Evans, a man she had met in church. Oh, I thought she was out of her mind crazy. I think you got engaged in February. Mm -hmm. We had previously gone out maybe into November. Mm -hmm. I'm going, we just went out like two or three months ago. Like, I can hold my breath that long. Like, what are you talking about? You're getting married. Do you think that you sort of gravitated towards the marriage because it gave you somebody to be with all the time? Well, I had my mom. To, yeah. <laughs> like, my mom was always with me, so I definitely had that. But he was taller and a bit thicker, broader shoulders, and I felt very protected with him. And he, he felt very safe for me and was somebody that I liked and trusted. And so we just developed a closer relationship and... I, I loved him. I definitely did. I think I just was caught up in, in a lot of things, and my emotions weren't... I thought I was in control, but I wasn't at all. Dave wasn't the only one skeptical of her plan to marry Jeremy. Yvette's mother, Linda, was also worried it was too soon. Linda passed away a few years ago, 
But her younger sister, Tony, remembers Yvette's mom was concerned about the timing of the marriage. Linda had a long conversation with Jeremy and said, you need to know what you're getting into. She's not healthy, mentally, emotionally, physically. There's a lot here to be dealt with. And she still has all of the court stuff she has to go through. I really think maybe you need to give this more time. And he was confident that he could handle it and things would be good. The wedding went forward in June of 1997, about 10 months after the shooting. Yvette was just 19 years old. She'd had this wedding in her mind of the the perfect reception, all those kind of things. And it gave her a new focus for a little bit. It was picture perfect. It was everything that she wanted it to be. And I think that was one of the silver linings in a really ugly time. The shooting became a shadow that followed her everywhere. For Yvette, it seemed impossible to escape. Nearly everyone saw her as the girl who'd been shot. It was on the news for quite a lot of time while the case was progressing. Every time there was a court hearing, there was news coverage. And I remember sitting in a restaurant once and just feeling everyone's eyes on me. And I think it was the day of a court hearing, so I was probably wearing the same clothes that were in the cameras, shots, and I felt like that person for so long. Yvette refused to be defined by the shooting. On her wedding day, she was just a beautiful bride. All the hope and optimism that belongs to newlyweds was hers. It was a princess dress. I used to have a gigantic bridal still around because it was such a pretty dress that I thought so. And I felt pretty and confident and all of the bullet wounds were covered on my head and all of the wounds on my sides were peeled pretty good. I don't think I, yeah, I wouldn't have any stitches. Dave admits that even on her wedding day, the shooting still framed how some people saw her. My mother... When I went, it is. It's just kind of a mechanical question. Well, how did she look? I mean, you mentioned to anybody in this world and they're shot five times or however many times. And your brain goes to a lot of strange places. And I just said she looked gorgeous. She looked great in a dress. And so I'm sure there was a lot of people dying to see how you'd look and you just radiated. Well, especially before social media. Like it wasn't like I was posting that I looked okay like The last people had seen me probably was coming out of the courthouse for the preliminary hearing. And that's just different than your wedding day. Yvette poured her energy into chasing her dreams. She earned a degree in broadcast journalism from the University of Utah. She pursued her ambition of being a TV reporter, landing a job with a sports department at KSL TV just as Salt Lake City prepared to host the 2002 Olympics. I got to do a lot of writing behind the scenes and then some editing. But she says the realities of working in front of the camera were not exactly what she expected. They let me try camera once and I was horrible. It was hard to realize that my goal of becoming a journalist was just not for me. I, I did not have the skill set for it. Yvette was disappointed, but she still couldn't shake the feeling that she'd survived that shooting for a reason. I've wondered, like, there must be a reason I'm here, right? I still, I need to do something. There's got to be some sort of purpose. And I didn't feel it for a long, long time. And that was really hard. I kept thinking, like, something's going to show up in my life and it's just going to work. As it turned out, the purpose she was searching for came in the form of a little girl named Romney Ray. The moment my daughter was born, it just hit me. So now I just have to make sure she stays alive. (laughs) Motherhood gave her the answers to questions that gnawed at her since she crawled to safety that fateful night. Since the shooting, I had felt like I just didn't know why I was saved. And I just didn't really have kind of purpose moving forward. I I had jobs, I was going to school, I did all the things you're supposed to do. 
But until Romney, that day she was born, I was like, yes, this is what I was here to do. After the break, Yvette finds another purpose in a new career. I'm really excited to tell you about The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast that we think the listeners of The Letter will also enjoy in their podcast queue. In every episode of this show, Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people, from athletes, authors, and scientists, to FBI agents, political activists, and even hostage negotiators. Jordan Harbinger has an undeniable talent for getting his guests to share stories that they may never have shared publicly before. His conversations are full of never-been-heard-before stories and thought-provoking insights. And without fail, he pulls out tactical bits of wisdom from each guest, and you can't help but be a more informed, critical thinker. A recent episode had me examining my own life. It was with financial psychologist Dr. Brad Klontz on how our financial choices are often the result of beliefs and habits that were instilled in us as children. It was fascinating. But honestly, with new episodes every week coming out weekly, the top spot for my favorite episode is constantly evolving. You cannot go wrong with adding The Jordan Harbinger Show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting, and there's never a dull show. Go to jordanharbinger.com slash start for more episode recommendations, or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. In my life, there's never enough time to read all the great books that have been written. My days are spent on the move, which is why Audible is one of my favorite apps. While I love reading, there is also something about listening to a story that feels different, maybe slightly more intimate. The best part of Audible is that I can listen while I hike, clean my house, or run errands. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries, self-help, wellness, business, and more. As an Audible member, I get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Right now, I'm listening to The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It's based on what happened at a real reform school in Florida for more than 111 years. It's gut-wrenching, maddening, and completely captivating. I also just finished Between Two Kingdoms, a memoir by Sulika Jawad, who spent her early 20s battling leukemia. This one is read by the author, and it's so beautifully written about where the best and worst parts of our lives overlap that I had to buy the hard copy so I could scribble some notes as I listened. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500. That's audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500 to try Audible for free for 30 days. Audible.com slash the letter. When Yvette was in college, she worked at a law firm. Then when journalism didn't work out, she decided to put that experience to use. She applied to be the assistant for a newly appointed federal court judge, Paul Cassell. Got about 150 applications for the job, and she uh, sort of rose to the top of the pile. Judge Cassell says Yvette's application was distinctive because of her unique personal experience with the criminal justice system. Suddenly, the shadow she tried to escape became the reason she stood out. She had more than the required credentials. I saw that she had this extraordinary uh, personal story uh, as well, which uh, I viewed as a positive in in terms of hiring her. In addition to his post as a judge, Cassell was a professor of law with a particular interest in victims' rights. In my view, all too often we view the criminal justice process as just involving the state and the defendant and making sure their interests are protected. But I think we have compelling interests that need to be protected from crime victims. So I've done a lot of work with crime victims and and have come to appreciate uh, their sort of resiliency and and their trust in the system that sometimes uh, lets them down. And so when I was thinking about bringing somebody in to work for me as a judicial assistant, somebody who had had been through the system, I thought might have a leg up. And Yvette's attitude made that decision even easier. 
And she just walked in the room and immediately lit up the room. She had such a love of life and, and was so outgoing and enthusiastic and cheerful. You know, I, I know it seems odd to, when you think about the victimization that she suffered, but in addition to all her other, you know, professional credentials, just the, the sort of personal side of things was the real, um, you know, clincher. And that's how I, I got the job and got to be around the federal court all the time, mm-hmm. see great defense attorneys, great prosecutors, not good prosecutors. Working for Judge Cassell, Yvette discovered she had a passion for the law. And one day I just thought, I, I like this. Like, I like this work. Why not try? Yvette's decision to go to law school began an emotional shift in her life. She started to feel like she was putting distance between herself and that terrible night. Maybe just some extra independent thinking and realizing I can make decisions for me. I chose to go to law school, and that was a really, really hard decision. So I think maybe starting life decisions like that gave me a little bit of confidence. It wasn't the career path that anyone expected for her. It was, after all, a job that would immerse her in the criminal justice system, where her first and only experience was associated with such a traumatic time in her life. But once she made the decision, a change came over her. It changed her whole trajectory. Her Aunt Tony says it gave her life a sense of direction. That's when we started seeing more glimpses of the girl that we'd known all of her life up to the date of shooting. The one who said, I can make this happen, and yeah, this isn't going to be an easy road, but I'm going to get on this road because I'm going to help to make a change. This justice system is, it has so many good things about it, but it has a lot, a lot of problems. From the outside, Yvette seemed to be effectively juggling her life's demands. Working part-time for Judge Cassell, raising a young child, and succeeding in law school. But privately, she was struggling. She still had short-term memory issues from the brain injury. She struggled with fear, her nightmares were not going away, and her marriage was suffering. Yvette says her husband tried to be understanding, but he was reaching his limit. He absolutely had extra sensitivity for a lot of years. It gets draining, and I wasn't working on it yet, or working on moving forward as he would want me to. So it did become harder for him to be a bit more patient with it, but he was never rude about it or angry about it. My husband and I had a really good friendship, good relationship. We tried for several years to have a baby, and she was three when I went to law school. And it just, law school was a lot, and being married young is a lot. And so after law school, a little bit after, we separated and then about a year later got a divorce. And that has been extremely hard. And this is one of the ways in which Yvette's survivor's guilt comes back to haunt her. Throughout her life, she often asks herself, what would Zachary do? What would he think of her decisions? And a lot of times I think of Zach in that he wouldn't have gotten a divorce you think he would have stuck it out? Maybe stuck it out or had a different picker, Yeah. Do you Do you feel like you're measuring yourself sometimes against an impossible ruler, though? I mean, he didn't live a life. It's easy not to get divorced when you never got married. You know what I mean? So, I mean, are you sometimes feeling like maybe you're idealizing him too much? He was just so good. (laughs) Like, I... I can't imagine that he would have done anything less than amazing things. Yvette's mother, Linda, and Aunt Tony worried that her expectations for herself were impossibly high. I don't know how many different times Linda and I talked about it, and we literally could not speak about it together without crying. It happened many, many times that we would talk about She's incredible. I don't know how she's doing it. There were some times that Linda even said as her mom, 
I really want her to be able to do this because she's earned it and she's working so hard. There's part of me that just wants to say, it's okay, you don't have to. That just says, you can quit. You don't have to keep going. Linda wasn't a quitter herself, so it was interesting to hear her say that, but I so understood and felt the same way. I was like, has she set her bar too high? Can she really do this? Not because we didn't believe in her, but because we knew what obstacles she had to overcome. Yvette graduated law school in 2008. She became a staff attorney for a nonprofit legal clinic that represented and advocated for victims. It was a chance to help people in ways she'd yearned for when she was navigating those first few months and years after the shooting. She began to use what happened to her to help educate others. This led to being a sought-after speaker. She could address victims' rights and the issues surrounding them in a way that not many people could. Her legal training combined with her own survival story became a powerful educational tool. It gave her a chance to let people know what life as a survivor really looked like. When you listen to her talk, there's no way you can't come away inspired. Yvette's Aunt Tony was in the audience for some of her appearances. She says her niece turned tragedy into triumph. She refused to let the man who victimized her take any more of her life. She says that that's the only way that I win is if I acknowledged that I can't let him have any more than he took from me. He took my dearest friend. He took much of my health. He took my safety being alone. He took my love for the mountains. He took my fun night stuff that now I don't like to be out at night. He took all of those things from me, but he can't take my spirit. There was not a dry eye in the place because she was saying, I am who I am because I overcame. News organizations also turned to Yvette for help and insight as random shootings became commonplace. In 2011, Arizona Representative Gabby Giffords and 18 other people were shot at an event she was holding with constituents outside of a grocery store. 22-year-old Jared Lee Loeffner shot Giffords in the head at point-blank range. Then he fired randomly at other members of the crowd. KSL asked Yvette to help viewers understand what was to come. When she heard about the Arizona shootings, she immediately thought of the wounded survivors, especially those who may not get as much public attention as the congresswoman. It's those other people that are kind of going to be the behind the scenes victims, that that's who I'm really thinking about. After the shock wears off and the physical injuries are treated, Yvette told viewers, it's the psychological wounds that take time to heal. Emotionally, um, I think I'm still doing it. I think I'm still in the process. What once seemed an irrational nightmare for Yvette has become this country's reality. The unfortunate part is that now we all have these places that are not safe. So, you know, 20 years ago, me thinking I wasn't safe at a grocery store, people would probably laugh at me. And it would take me a minute to go back to a grocery store. But somebody could say to you, oh, come on, it's just a movie theater. It's just, you know, what's going to happen at the Walmart, right? Exactly. And you could be like, oh, okay, you're right. I'm being silly. This is a nightmare. I, I could put it in perspective. But you don't have that luxury anymore. No. And I just feel bad for other people. Like, I'm kind of used to it now, which is horrible, but it's my life. But. For all these people that every day it just changes for them, I I just ache. It's just a different world they're entering in. Yvette knows firsthand that the repercussions of incidents like this stretch far beyond the lives lost. So many lives are changed when someone does these horrible random acts of violence. The ripple that goes out is so big, but we're not really addressing that. We're We're not even really addressing any of it. (laughs) Around that time, Yvette sought some psychological help. She had seen a counselor immediately after the shooting, but she says back then she wasn't ready. 
that's the interesting part. I think we all think, oh, you need to go right now, mm -hmm. fix this right now. And that for me wasn't, wasn't helpful. It made it feel like I wasn't doing what people thought I needed to do. What was it about the experience that required time? It was entirely me keeping myself stuck. I think a lot of it is survivor's guilt that if I'm not stuck, then I'm not being aware of Zach and him being gone. If by staying stuck, that means I'm acknowledging every day that I'm alive and Zach's not. But I don't think I felt like I had value that would let me be me without the shooting as part of me. Like, I think it... I, you didn't have any inherent value. It's that you were no. a survivor. That was what it was. Yes. Wow. That makes me so sad. <laughs> Saying it out loud makes it sound much worse than it kind of feels in my head. In my head, it doesn't feel as extreme, but saying those words is pretty intense. I'm sure you've run into victims though, that feel that same way. Yeah, they do. And that's when I am working with victims, I never tell them they don't know my story. But when they do say things like that, hopefully they can just feel a bit more understanding, maybe from my eyes, or hopefully I have a response that's useful. So I, it's a common thing. It's not, I'm not unique in, in these feelings. Through therapy, Yvette was learning to let herself off the hook a little. She was going to make mistakes, and maybe that was okay. And it was also okay to have fun, to feel happiness. And one of the things that made her happy was karaoke. Thursday night karaoke was really big. You know, you find fun friends, and they push you out of your, your comfort zone, and then you're happy as could be. Do you sing? No. Well, oh. well... Yes. Is it good? Mechanical? No. Yes, it <laughs> the the it, like when I started singing for Romney when she was born, she would cry. She, she hates my singing. <laughs> but I understand so what, what she's saying. So what's your go-to karaoke song? I'm curious. Uh, hold on, Wilson Phillips. And this is when Dave came back into Yvette's life. He reached out to her through Facebook just to see how she was doing not knowing that she was divorced. Soon, he found himself singing karaoke too. I yeah. did get dumped into it because Yvette did have a strong, I think also uh, in Utah when you're a single female, you tend to group with others and go out. They were addicted to karaoke. So I had never really done karaoke until I met them and just, they got to know the DJ and the bar owner and they would make full signs for them on their birthday. So it was their night and Baptism by fire of a lot of Bon Jovi. Their rekindled friendship continued to blossom, even as Yvette shared all the ways the terror of that night still haunted her life. By the time Dave decided to ask Yvette to be his wife, he was going into the union with his eyes wide open. But even the proposal wasn't free from the trauma of her past. Took her on a hike one day and got down on a knee and proposed she graciously said yes but i kid i mean it was just like the gods were just laughing in irony literally within 30 seconds oh yeah right a bunch then. of campers a half mile up just started blasting rifles just target practicing and i was just like you've got to be kidding me we both just laughed because it was like of course after everything that happened like that's the thing that you know it was definitely a quick kiss and then i think i started crying more because of the gunshot not because yeah. of the okay, proposal well, sorry we're not sit, in, <laughs> sit in you know just enjoy the moment let's get back to the cab yeah i remember crying but i am sorry it wasn't no, because it was, it was so beautiful we're, it we're, was beautiful we're big on irony and laughing in life and that's it was just a way like okay back to reality <laughs> Dave and Yvette were finally married in 2012, 16 years after cannon fire forced an early end to their date at a football game. Dave likes to joke that he's been to all of Yvette's weddings. 
He just hopes he doesn't get an invitation to another one. Humor is one of the ways they keep the shadows at bay. It was smooth sailing for a while, but there are more unexpected twists and turns to come. That's after the break. Tired of the same old game nights? Bored with the same old board games or card games? Looking for a fun new activity to do with your family, your partner, your friends, or even by yourself? You should check out Hunt a Killer. With Hunt a Killer, you get to be the detective, sorting through evidence, piecing together clues, and solving the case in an immersive murder mystery game. Each Hunt a Killer box is a complete murder mystery that you have to solve. Pick from standalone one shot crimes, longer multi chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. Just like real detective work, you must establish means, motive, and opportunity for each suspect. It's like your own episode of CSI combined with an escape room. I received the Dead on the Vine box, which was a twisting, turning, totally consuming whodunit. In this game, the family's matriarch is poisoned, and the killer had to be a member of her family. We love the ciphers, puzzles, and secrets we had to uncover in solving the crime. And because I've not so secretly wanted to be a private detective since I was a kid, I can't wait to start my next case. Take the case at huntakiller.com slash the letter and use code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. A good therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. And BetterHelp Online Therapy can give you access to the right therapist for you. If I can share a little bit about my own mental health struggles. As a survivor of domestic abuse, therapy became my lifeline, a way out of what felt like endless darkness and pain. It has helped me more effectively manage problems throughout my life, some of them big and complicated like PTSD, while others are more mundane, like phases of life changes. I just recently started using BetterHelp, and I'm a huge fan, not just of what they do, but how they do it. Being able to talk with a licensed therapist who is matched with me and my specific needs in my own home, sometimes at times that a traditional therapist wouldn't be available, has been life-changing. I am so grateful for BetterHelp. BetterHelp can match you with a therapist after you fill out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. Honestly, this process was much easier and much faster than the traditional routes I've used in the past. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. When you want to become a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash the letter today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash the letter. Yvette created a fulfilling and stable life for herself. She'd found purpose working as a victim witness coordinator at the U.S. Attorney's Office. But in 2014, her life was once again upended by violence. Good morning to you. It is just before 10 o'clock and we have some breaking news right now from Salt Lake City where police have just confirmed a shooting at the new federal courthouse in downtown Salt Lake City. A new specialist, Haley Smith, is live on the scene. Yvette was in the federal courthouse when a defendant charged the witness as he testified. The defendant, Siali Angelau, was shot four times by a U.S. Marshal and was killed. The courthouse was put on lockdown for about 45 minutes before people were slowly escorted out. All of the witnesses I spoke with today were extremely anxious and ready to leave the courthouse. It was so scary for me, and it was probably the most anxious and fearful I have been since we were shot. Yvette was consumed with fear, fear that violence could find her anywhere, and fear that if people found out she was in the courthouse, she'd fall back into the shadows of an identity she'd worked so hard to escape. And I don't think I wanted people to really know or feel bad for me or... I think I, I was hoping I could just do it all on my own. And 
I couldn't. I was a mess for months after being in that room. The noise, the smells, it just, I hadn't experienced anything like that since we were shot and it brought so much back. I was shocked that I reacted so strongly. I thought I was way past the shooting and that this would just be a weird thing for me, but it, I couldn't be alone. Dave walked me to and from work. Um, I was never by myself at the office. Yvette soon realized that her strategy of just pushing through, like she'd done after she was shot, wasn't going to work as well this time. I think I was extra terrified that because I was responding so negatively and and I was so crushed that I wasn't going to be able to get past it. I thought if I made it through so many years and I did okay, but if this if this is the way I'm responding to this shooting, maybe this is going to be my new normal because I can't do it. I can't push through it. I really, I was stuck for quite a while. The setback was profound and it blindsided Yvette. She was terrified that this time she'd never be able to find her way back to peace and safety. I did go back to therapy, which I think was very helpful and I'm glad that I did. But I hadn't wanted to be in therapy for a long time. I'd felt pretty solid. I think what I missed most was that I had gotten to this really lovely place of safety and I felt safe everywhere I was, especially in the courthouse. And it took away that safety for a long, long time. And that was really hard for me. Yvette did find her way back to solid ground once again. With patience, support, and professional guidance, she not only found a feeling of safety in her life, but also in the courtroom. And in fact, she decided she wanted to advocate in a different way. She took a job as a prosecutor for one of Utah's largest cities, West Valley City. Go ahead, Ms. Rodney. Did you want to go first then on the um, motion for pretrial detention? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, when the court shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic, hearings moved online. Yvette's office is now her dining room table. She addresses the judge from a laptop surrounded by file folders and books as her faithful lab sleeps on a fluffy dog bed nearby. But there is substantial evidence to support the charge. That's why we have charged uh, with the threats where a defendant threatened to slit the victim's throat if she called the police or her sister. Or the, excuse me. So what, what made you decide to go from the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecuting? I really missed the courtroom. I mean, I was in the courtroom, but I missed the advocacy that can be there. So when I was doing victims' rights, I was in the courtroom in front of the bar arguing, and prosecution just always seemed so- like something I could do. I wasn't mm-hmm. sure. So I'm grateful West Valley gave me a chance to try it, and I love it. Her work as a prosecutor still allows her to interact with victims. In this case, she invites a woman to speak in court, instructing her on what might be helpful for the judge. Maybe, Ms. Spears, would you please tell the court how you feel about, we're talking about only his detention status right now, so um, how do you feel about him being in custody and a potential release? Maybe we just focus on those two things. Yvette prosecutes misdemeanors for the city, and she is content in that role. While many attorneys can't wait to move on to felonies, she sees real value in working misdemeanor cases. Offenses like assault, shoplifting, drunk driving, and domestic violence. Misdemeanors, I feel like there's still a chance. I feel like these are offenders who made mistakes, and hopefully they can fix it. I think at some point I will prosecute felonies. As of right now, I'm really comfortable with misdemeanors. Felonies are a lot more life-changing, and and there's bigger consequences. So I feel like right now I can do or try to do some good with, with the misdemeanor work. After all these years, Yvette's younger sister, Danielle, is still in awe of her big sister. She sees the world in this unique light where she has every opportunity to 
pay attention to the, the darkness or the hard things that are going on. Even in her job, she sees a lot of bleh. <laughs> and she still wants to share love and light with everyone. She's not a victim of her story. She was a victim in her circumstance, but she has not carried that story with her as the victim, which is so beautiful. She's used it to empower herself and others. At first glance, Yvette and Dave live a remarkably normal life. But the reality is, they live with the shadows of grief and trauma that still stalk Yvette. To gain the upper hand, they have some rules they employ to keep peace with the shadows. As Yvette decided in those first few days after the shooting, they never say the name of the man who shot her and Zach. They avoid fireworks, and they mute shows or movies with gunfire. For years, Yvette did not feel safe in the mountains, a place that was once a refuge. But recently, she and Dave bought a trailer, and that has given her a way back into the wild. And once we got a trailer, the mountains have opened up for me. Sometimes when we camp and it's just, we just find a lone spot, I feel a bit more anxious, but he knows, and so he watches and just a few extra hand-holding or rubbing my shoulder and that he's aware that I'm aware we're out in the middle of nowhere by ourselves, but we're safe, it's fine. Yvette has figured out a way to manage the triggers, and that's allowed her to reclaim the things that bring her joy, like escaping life's distractions with a trip to the backcountry. But no matter where she is or what she's doing, Zach is always with her. Do you think about Zach every day? Absolutely. In, in what way? Most of the time, it's really happy. It's f- fun memories. Um, when I mess up or feel like I've made mistakes, then it's, oh, goodness, how much have I disappointed him? Um, and then there's just the aching, the missing, the what would he be? How would he be doing? What would be going on in his life right now? Even more than 25 years later, Yvette can't seem to forgive herself for surviving the attack. When she sinks into the pain, she swims through a river of regrets. I definitely feel so bad that I did leave him. I, I often wonder why I didn't just stay and hold him, why I didn't try to put pressure on his wounds. Um, Do you know if he was alive when you left him? I'm fairly certain he was dead when I left him. And since all of the things happened, I did learn in court that the very first bullet that hit him killed him. So he he was dead. But I didn't know. And, and why wouldn't I have just stayed with him and just held him? He, he would have done that for me. Do you feel like you have to live for both of you now, somewhat? Um, I think I used to, but that was really hard. <laughs> that was just more than than I could do. Just because I'm human, I make all sorts of mistakes. And I know Zach would have too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just felt like I was disappointing him so much that it was finally... At some point, I had to stop thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And just live for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yvette knows that she will never escape or forget what happened. And she's made peace with that. It cannot be erased. It has to be redefined. I've figured out where it belongs in my life, that it is a part of my life. It's a part of my story. And why would you move on or get rid of a part of your story? It's what made me who I am today. And I'm really finally at a place that I like who I am. And 
who I am is because of the shooting and because of knowing Zach and people that have been good examples for me. So it's not moving on. It's just I've got a little compartment for it, for the shooting, and it's there. It's in my brain. It's in my heart. And I'm okay with when it chooses to manifest itself. It doesn't scare me anymore. Yvette has refused to let the shadows from that moonlit night at Little Dell Reservoir devour her life. She has created a life where the man who tried to kill her has no place. But after all these years, the man she never names is going to make an attempt to come back into the lives of his victims. And Yvette will have to decide if she wants to open the gate that has given her peace. Next time on The Letter, the Snars receive an unexpected delivery. She finished the letter and it was just silent for a minute. And I said to my mom, I'm like, I, I needed to hear that. I can breathe for the first time in 24 years. Like I could take a deep breath and not feel that crack in my heart. What's it like to have your personal heartbreaking story told in a podcast for all the world to hear? I'm producer Andreas Martin, and on this week's bonus episode, Amy talks with Zachary Snar's sister, Cindy, about what it's like for her to revisit her brother's murder and about the surprising conversations it's bringing up among friends and neighbors. We also bring in one of Sydney's friends to talk about how listening to the podcast has changed their relationship. You can get all the bonus content and some great things we couldn't fit in the main story by subscribing to Lemonada Premium. You can subscribe right now in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then click the subscribe button. The letter is researched and reported by me, Amy Donaldson. It's written by myself and Andrea Smartin, who is also responsible for production and sound design. Mixing by Trent Sell. Special thanks to Nina Ernest, Becky Bruce, Kellyanne Halverson, Ryan Meeks, Josh Tilton, Ben Kiebrick, and Dave Colley. Main musical score composed by Allison Leighton Brown. With KSL Podcast executive producer Cheryl Worsley. For Lemonada Media, executive producers Jessica Cordova Kramer and Stephanie Whittleswax. And executive producers Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella with Workhouse Media. If you like our show, Please give us a rating and a review. It helps people find us. Follow us at theletterpodcast.com and on social at the Letter Podcast. We've been hearing from some of you about your experience with the podcast, and we would love to hear more. If you have a comment or question, feel free to leave us a voicemail at 801-575-4398. That's 801-575-4398. We might play it on the show or in a bonus episode. The Letter is produced by KSL Podcasts and Lemonada Media in association with Workhouse Media. Hey, The Letter listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is because they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things that you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By answering just a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip. And also, keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com survey.
The Webby award-winning series, The Untold Story, is back for season three. In season one, The Untold Story took a deep dive into the pitfalls of modern policing. The second season explored the failings of the American court system. In this new season, host Trayvon Free shines a light on human rights violations that are taking place right before our eyes in America. Each episode contains tangible, real strategies to begin enacting positive change in our communities. All three episodes of Untold Story, Criminal Injustice from Lemonada Media premiere on October 25th, wherever you get your podcasts.